Uh, evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Asim, and uh, I'm the director of front end engineering at a company called Modis. We are a design and engineering studio not too far from here in Midtown. Uh, those are my deets. You can uh, tweet at me. So I've been using Vue uh, for about two ish years in production. And over the last two years, we've uh, built uh, two large versions of an application, which I'll show here, uh, for the real estate industry. Uh, we've recently launched the second version of the app that relies heavily on Vuex. Um, we had about three front-end devs working uh, over a four-month timeline to get this to production. And I'm really just here to highlight some of the problems we faced and uh, how we solved them and the lessons we've learned. Uh, before I dive into that, how many people actually use Vue in the room? All right, awesome. And I'm guessing all of you have used Vuex as well? Right, awesome. So uh, I'm going to just jump into a uh, screen capture of the app. Uh, this is a, basically an app that allows you to fill in a bunch of details about yourself very quickly and matches you with real estate agents to handle corporate moves from one part of the country to the other. Uh, so I'll just play this. Uh, so you basically go in, uh, put in your address, uh, it locates you, uh, you specify what kind of property you're selling, uh, how much you think it's worth. Um, you'll probably say, oh, I'm actually living here, but I want to move to Dallas or whatever. And uh, I'm actually interested in selling a condo. And uh, as you can see, as you navigate through the questions of this app, you can see that sidebar is uh, saving all your answers. Uh, you, you answer a few more questions about what it is, uh, what your move looks like. And uh, finally, uh, you know, once you're done answering the questions, we have this lovely legal agreement that we need you to sign, after which uh, a match happens on the back end, and um, uh, once the match occurs, it matches you with the best real estate agents uh, that can serve your needs. Right? You will uh, go ahead and uh, defer all your choices in life to us uh, automatically and uh, basically select the agents you want to work for. And uh, that's pretty much it. After this, the business processes take over, right? So that was a very quick rundown, and that is the speed at which we expect every user to use the app as well. Um, that's a quick rundown of what the app looks like. Um, so it's a pretty straightforward looking app. You know, it's like, hey, some questions, tell us this, tell us that, backend algo, boom. Done. So why are you here, bearded man, talking about this late into the middle of the night? Um, well, because even though the app seems simple, this is uh, one of those enterprise real estate applications, and it has some major challenges. Um, first off, this is a business logic bonanza, as we like to call it. Uh, there is an obscene amount of business logic on the client. Uh, that little app with uh, about 14, 15 screens actually compresses down to about 150 kilobytes. So it's not as tiny as you know, uh, the UI would make it seem. Uh, you saw the desktop portion. This app actually has a very rich and you know, component rich mobile interface, and it also um, runs on both desktop browsers, mobile browsers, a native web view inside native apps, and it runs on Internet Explorer. Yes, I said it. Um, um, but most of all, you know, while those challenges were pertinent, I think the biggest challenge here was navigation. Now, one of the things that uh, Vue developers may know is we have this lovely Vue router that allows us to create routes and, and uh, navigate our users through our app. In this application, there was a lot of conditional navigation. So if you said you were living in South Dakota and you happened to be selling a house which was worth this much and your grandmother's middle name was Rebecca, this is what would happen. And this was everywhere. There was business logic that was interspersed throughout the client. 
Uh, and you'd often wonder why not abstract all that to the server side. It's because the uh, client that we were serving wants like expediency and speed, and you know they don't want this interaction where you have progress loaders showing up. As you saw in the demo, we just sped through the entire application. Um, and then one of these other interesting things that we discovered as a consequence of our architecture was the back button on the browser caused our life to become a living hell, and I'll show you why. Um, but before we dive into a detailed analysis of the problem, so uh, the design team uh, came up with a sidebar, and they were like, oh yeah, you're gonna get real-time feedback, you can write your answers in and see them in the sidebar, you can use each sidebar item to directly navigate to that you know, go back in time in your applications, change your answers. So kind of like a live editing. And there was this little progress indicator that let you know how close you were to the end of the app. Um, so just keep that in mind. So to, to explain the challenge at hand, uh, let's imagine that we had, uh, you know, about 15 screens in the app. And uh, the, the, the screens that are encoded, the blue would always be shown. Um, on the first screen, you were presented with three options. So if you chose option A, you would see only the yellow screens. And if you chose option B, you would see only the pink screens. And you know, the green screens were what the back end decided that it would let you show, right? So this was, in 2016, this was the original idea that the business people had, like this is how we want it. All right, so we built version one, it was great, we launched it, and uh, then they were like, you know what, um, we only want you to show one green screen if the users chose option A. We're like, oh, okay, not a big deal. And then they were like, but then when they chose option B, we wanted you to show these two green screens, sure. And then finally, if they chose a third option, we wanted you to show everything. So already, there was enough business logic. Although not untenable, there was enough business logic routing you around. So we were designing the architecture as you know, the business people continue to have meetings in remote corners of the office. And then they came back and said, once our architecture was in place, they were like, nah, everything we told you, you know, was, a, was incomplete. So if on the second screen someone said X, but then on the fifth screen they said Y, then you don't show them these two red screens, pull down the tenth screen a little bit, and you know what? There is no order to anything in the green section altogether. We are rewriting our match algorithm on the back end, and the back end will tell you how many screens to render and how many instances of each screen to show. So you could show two, 12 screens, or you could show one instance of the 13 screen. So it became, you know, uh, there was a point in time where pretty much um, it was just getting crazier. And then somewhere down the line, we realized that if you ended up at screen number 14, which is probably one point away from, you know, saving grace, um, and you decided to use that lovely sidebar and go back, and change one of your answers, and that happened to be that interesting business case, everything you just saw had to be completely invalidated. You know, because you've changed your answers, and now we have to match you again and find new real estate agents who could handle your move. So, at this point, I was pretty much like this. <laughs> I was like, hey man, I need to consider a different industry. These guys are insane, right? But then, you know, I woke up one morning and I was like, what if the entire navigation, like traditionally, I, I go about saying that front-end developers these days are paid to manage state. That's pretty much what we do. We just manage state. And we like, write a little bit of HTML and CSS. Um, but I had this idea, what if your navigation itself was part of the state of the app, right? So, we know that Vuex, which is, a, which is probably the best state management you know, tool that you could use, has these observable patterns which are watching state change silently, right? And just like you click something and 
something turns red or something turns green. That's business logic pertinent to your UI. What if we changed navigation related state as these decisions were being made in the app and that would in turn allow us to navigate you know, based on these decisions that were being made based on user input. And so we put this theory to the test. But we had four commandments. One, make sure every screen was described through data. So if there was a question on that screen, what is going to be the answer of that screen? Is the user currently on that screen? How many units is he away from that screen? Every detail about a screen had to be described through data. Secondly, we realized that you know, the users are going to make decisions, and we're going to have discrete points in time to understand what to do next. right? Because the user could only be at one screen at one time. right? Uh, and so what we decided was we're never going to have any static links like you typically have in you know, router-driven applications. You click this, it takes you to this route. No static links. Everything is going to be computed on the fly dynamically. And uh, I also had two other developers who were working with me who weren't half as insane by this time. And if we had to build this in this compressed timeline of four months, they had to have a very simple API where they say, click next, move forward, click back, move backward, or just take me to whatever screen. So navigation had to be reduced to a very simple functional system. And then, of course, the back button where you went all the way to the end and then you came back and like an evil person, you changed everything that you initially believed in. And then you tried to like game the system. So we called it the evil nav pattern and we had to make sure that we could detect that every time you know, the user changed from one screen to the other. So this is what ended up looking like, uh, this was the data model for every screen. I've, I've uh, snapshotted one single screen and one section. So you saw those colorful screens earlier on in the app. So each colored section would have a list of screens. Each screen would have all these descriptive properties. Right? Just to go over a few, if the screen would appear in the sidebar, could you directly navigate to it? You know, is the user currently at the screen? Uh, are we going to show the screen even? Is the screen a part of the flow? So all these properties essentially constitute the state of navigation-related items for each screen in the flow. And finally, we were like, you know, where in the app do we decide that something needs to change from a navigation standpoint? So we identified. Uh, at the time, it was four different key points in time when we needed to make decisions about, hey, if you're doing this and you said yes to this and you said no to that, your flow is going to change based on these decisions. And so for each decision point, we had a recompute mutation. So I'll, I'll give you a peek into the code at this time. Um, let's zoom that in. So this is uh, about 1,000 lines of code, uh, only dedicated to navigation. Um, and so if you look for recompute, you know there are three or four different times we would actually recompute what would happen. So as I said, if you were in the first screen and you chose option A, we would decide what your flow would look like until we reach the next decision point and then consolidating the information you provided previously, we would determine where you would go. So in this case, we would uh, recompute the path on the first screen. So if you were selling, we would show you something else. If you were buying, we would do something else. But the beauty of it is, everything that we were changing or deciding was reflected in the state, not necessarily in some URL scheme or something else. So we just kept making mutations onto our state and uh, so that basically allowed us to map the user's flow through data. So that was pretty cool. And then we decided to create a simple navigation API. Um, so a developer working on this project would basically create a UI where you clicked, 
I'm done with this screen, I want to go forward, and they would write one line of code which would cause a mutation, and that function inherently acted as an API for all the front-end developers. Um, so this is what moving forward in the app looked like. It would determine where you were, uh, it would then go through the entire state and figure out which screens are actually you're allowed to see at this time. It would then compose the best next route for you and then return that, which would in turn feed to the router, and that's how you would travel through the app. And finally, the back button and all those lovely problems. Um, we realized that just before we uh, decided on showing the green section, uh, there was one screen where we would make the call to the back end. And the screen would basically show you a progress bar and said, hey, we're processing stuff, just chill out. And so we realized that if a person went back and modified everything, we just had to detect when that happened and just route them back to screen number 11, which would then automatically Ask the back end, hey, here's the new information. What do you think the path forward looks like? And that funneling of people uh, into that uh, section of the app uh, really helped simplify everything. Um, and so uh, what we would do is the view router would provide us this interesting hook. Whenever a person changed the route, we would get uh, you know, a callback, and we were required to do something. And uh, this is the line of production code that we have. Ask the store if the user is being evil, right? And basically, this function would take in two paths, where you're coming from and where you're going. And we would understand, are you coming from the dynamic portion of the app to the static portion? Have you changed something in the data? And then it would return a true or false value based on which we could funnel the user back through the app. And uh, uh, so yeah, that, that was basically the architecture we had where uh, the router was driven completely by the store and the store was constantly mutated by UI interactions. And that is how uh, you know, we, we handled this crazy navigation. And uh, the good thing about this is since then, you know, many more business rules have been added to the navigation, and this paradigm really scales well on the front end. We just understand, oh, is there a decision discreetly being made in time? Write some business logic for it, mutate the state, check for evil navigation, and then uh, Vuex and View Router take care of everything else. Um, yeah, so that was, uh, that was the lesson we learned. Thank you for having me and sharing and being a part of this. <laughs>